Um, great. And we've got Bill Clower here in the upper left for most of you. Uh, Bill's the town historian, uh, co-president with me on the Acton Historical Society. And let me see if I can get my screen sharing going. I hate that representation. That means I got to come up with the right answers. <laughs> well, you're pretty good at that, Bill. Um, oh, thank okay, you. So hopefully everybody can see the first uh, screen of the presentation. Um, if you can't, just raise your hand. <laughs> Good. Um, so what we wanted to do, and, and if you've noticed, we're calling this a history of Acton. Um, there are really many histories of Acton. Um, whoever gets to write history, um, whoever gets to interpret history throughout the years um, is, is always changing. And so this represents uh, something that Bill Clower and I have, have pulled together. Um, and hopefully within less than an hour, we're going to summarize the, uh, uh, the 300 plus, almost 300 years, um, actually 300, uh, almost 400 years. So, um, no, actually, oh, I'm getting my math wrong. Welcome Bill, jump in here. <laughs> so from 1735 to today. Um, so what we're going to try to do is go over some of the, the, the early um, elements of history, talk about it as an agricultural town, really how it developed out of Concord, um, how the geology uh, permitted uh, really good transportation uh, that, that helped with industry. We'll talk about recent growth, and if we have time, we'll go over some of the um, uh, significant buildings. Um, but I think the main point that we want to make here is that Acton, like many colonial towns, um, has its identity very steeped in the colonial period. We're not going to go over the Revolutionary War. We did that in a previous presentation, although we'll, we'll do some references to it. Um, this is an interesting old map, as you can see on the lower left. Uh, this was before Maynard was created out of Stowe and Sudbury. You can see it over here. Um, but you can, you can see that there are some significant major roads going through Acton, and that was very helpful in the development, as you'll see. So I'm going to turn this over to Bill, and he's going to talk a little bit about um, Acton going. generally, and then uh, go into the different uh, villages of Acton. Thanks, Doug. When we first got this little parcel of land that we call home. Uh, one of the first things that we had to do was to come up with a meeting house. And a committee chose the site of it to be the corner of Nagar Kill Road and Main Street. Uh, that was in 1738, we built the first one and by 187, uh, the town's population had grown to about 900, which is a little bit more than uh, what the building inspector wanted us inside that building. So at that point in time, they decided to build a larger second meeting house. And we'll uh, see that most things changed, including the whole layout of Acton Center. The that's the that's Acton Center as a section of town. Now we have South Acton, which is supposedly the oldest of the villages, and it evolved early on because of water power. West Acton came in somewhat later. They did not have the water power, even though they had a brook, the same brook for that matter. Uh, North Acton had granite, Lake Nagog, a few other things such as uh, plenty of granite. And they didn't really evolve until the railroad some years later. East Acton early on had Neshoba Brook. And these are the things that would account for the early development. Uh, 
I believe that we're not going to look at Powder Mill Village as a village of its own because it was part of South Act and it was part of Maynard, but it evolved in a totally different way, like a mill town. So uh, those are our village centers. So I'll jump in here a little bit. Um, I think one of the most basic elements of, of Acton is, is clearly its geology. And, you know, Acton represents one of the many um, landforms that were created in New England when the glaciers started to recede um, about 20,000 years or so ago and uh, left an awful lot of glacial till, rocky soil. Um, as you can see from the lower right hand picture, this is typical of what glaciers would leave behind. Um, sometimes it would be large boulders. Other times there'd be outflow and lots of sand and till. But the result was it was a pretty tough place to, to plow and to grow things. Um, but it was great for livestock, orchards, haying around the, the brooks. And you end up with an awful lot of interesting landforms. Um, some of you have seen the drumlins, which are really just giant hills of of glacial till. There's eskers in um, the Arboretum, which are just ridges um, pushed up of glacial till. Kettle ponds where, where giant pieces of, of ice were left behind in a depression and eventually melted. So fortunately you have Fort Pond Brook, as, as Bill mentioned, and Neshoba Brook, um, that started off as, as pathways that later evolved into Indian paths and uh, roads and eventually railroads. And, and the granite uh, was, was really important, not just for North Acton, where the granite industry was, was um, local, but an awful lot of small outcroppings of ledge were used uh, by local farmers and people to just, you know, basically take out large pieces of, of granite for building foundations and uh, the, the, many, the many different mills uh, that needed dams and raceways. So around 10,000 uh, BC or so, um, some of the Native Americans from the Southwest started migrating up uh, as the ice receded. It became more temp uh, temperate. Uh, these are some arrow points and some spear points uh, that were found in the Pine Hawk site of South Acton. Uh, there were quite a few settlements of the Nipmuc and the Shoba groups. Um, it's hard to kind of identify specifically what groups were here. I've, I've read that a lot of the uh, Native American groups, um, the, the, the clans and the tribes were, were fairly flexible to some degree. They tended to, you know, create and break apart and absorb each other. Uh, but the result was that you had essentially a seasonal migratory set of, of paths and areas where following the rivers, uh, people would go in different seasons to, uh, to harvest crops, to plant, to fish, and to hunt. Um, these are some of the areas of, of the Pine Hawk site where an awful lot of, of elements were found. The Trail Through Time is another interesting Native American um, remnant area where lots of stone landscapes, ceremonial stone clusters um, are still there. When, I'll, I'll let Bill, you know, jump into some of this. I wanted to just point out the iron, um, the, the iron bog iron that was, was predominant in this area since people did not mine iron ore like they did out west, a lot of the iron that was in the different marshes and the water of the brooks would precipitate out into these large chunks. And those would essentially be collected or in some case dug out of the, the swamp and um, essentially, you know, melted down and, and used for uh, iron in the forges. Um, Bill, you want to jump in around um, the Simon Willard and, and Concord Iron Works? Yeah, the, um, the earliest site that we know of was the corner of River Street 
at Paca Street. It's still there today, the, the heap that was left from the smelting of the uh, iron ore. And the problem with the stuff was that it was found to be way too brittle when it was, when they tried to work at it. It, it just, it just would not gel correctly. So uh, if you made a pot or anything, it may work for a while, but it would soon develop cracks and it, and it just was pretty much worthless. This was the same way down in West Concord at the Orion Works and also uh, elsewhere around this part of the world. Uh, there were a couple of land grants, one for Simon Willard and uh, was more or less uh, a large land grant similar to the one at, uh, at the Ironworks, which was actually, I believe, only a thousand acres, but Simon Willard's was only was 5,000 acres, and it seemed to extend more towards the western, uh, west, northwest part of our town borders out towards Carlisle, Billerica. Billerica, by the way, was at one time a uh, neighbor of ours. Yeah. So you can you can see how land has towns have broken off in between, and we're much smaller today. Drumlins, those hills like Great Hill, Meads Hill, Wrights Hill, are pretty uh, pretty good for farming because during the daytime heat rises and you find that there's a current of air going up the side of it and at night it works down the opposite way. So the farm has found that this was very favorable for pollinating trees and that sort of stuff. So apples fared very, very well in this regard. So when, when Concord uh, started to run out of land, they look to Acton and some of the meadows as a perfect area for uh, managing some of their herds of cattle and some of their, their sheep. And so they basically petitioned the general court, which was the legislature back then, um, to extend their borders up into the area of, of South and West Acton, as well as East and North Acton. And John Law was the, the first shepherd who came by. He was a Scot, and um, Thomas Wheeler um, was in charge of what they call the dry cattle herd, you know, not the milk cows that had to stay uh, near the barns to be milked, but herds that could essentially last out, you know, for most of the summer um, out in the areas of Acton. So just to kind of level set everybody as far as what the farming was like in Acton initially, um, as in most of New England, it was based on the English mixed husbandry model, which had both livestock and tillage. Livestock was, was critically important to people, um, given the fact that it, it provided leather, it provided food, um, cattle provided you know, milk. So it was really critical to have the meadows and the hay fields because a lot of the assumption about what New England would look like when they first came over here, based on the latitude, they were assuming it would have a client similar to um, southern France. Uh, but when they got over here, they were in for quite a shock. The winters were a lot colder. As a result, they had to have a lot more silage and food uh, stored for the winter to get the cattle and the, and the animals through the winter. And so grazing areas were really important. Um, in addition to plowage, plow land, um, Bill mentioned the orchards, the meadows were incredibly important. In some ways, meadows and grasslands and marshes were how a lot of the, uh, the towns were formed uh, along the coast. Uh, the early colonists would sail up and down the coast when they would see salt marshes with either salt marsh hay or normal kind of um, normal water meadows, they would essentially land there and set up towns and, and start farming. 
So these were really important. You can't underestimate the value of meadows and woodlots were obviously important too. In terms of developing Acton as an agricultural town, most people know that there were Indian epidemics even before the Purit or the Pilgrims settled Plymouth in, in 1620. Um, fishermen, other folks that would be over here, not on a permanent settlement basis, but uh, coming by for trapping, uh, spread diseases. And between the epidemic of 1615 and the smallpox uh, outbreak of 1633, um, somewhere between 80 and 90% of the Native Americans were pretty much wiped out. And a lot of the farmers used the fields that they had essentially established using slash and burn techniques uh, to raise corn, beans, and squash were taken over by uh, the, new, the new colonists. Um, we mentioned the important importance of meadows and pasture land and Neshoba and, and Fort Pond Brooks had those because of the, the valleys. Um, let's see. Unlike, let's say, Virginia uh, that raised tobacco or the Caribbean that raised sugar, uh, New England's climate really didn't support a single culture. So they had to have a diverse set of different types of crops uh, and they were opportunistic in terms of what would grow and ended up with a fairly diverse um, set of, of, of crops such as apples, hops, um, barley. Wheat did not grow very well, but what they called Indian corn did. So most farms, you know, it was a combination of, of private and public. You know, the, the Puritans had a communal approach in which some land for both tillage and pasture was, was common and others were private. Uh, every home had its, its barn, its pen for animals, its vegetable gardens, as, as well as some of these common areas. One of the things that was obviously very important were the woodlots. Uh, and in addition to what we think of as normal uh, split wood uh, for, for burning in fireplaces, they, they cut down trees um, deciduous trees, not evergreens, and, and would, what they would call coppicing them, they would essentially cut them back and let the sap, uh, the, I'm sorry, um, the saplings, uh, the suckers grow up. And these were very important for all sorts of um, construction, you know, what we call uh, now plaster and lath, they would call wattle and daub, they would take these, these long poles and essentially weave them within walls and then use mud um, or plaster. And over here with this barrel, you can see that the hoop poles were a very important industry in Acton um, in which they would essentially split these, these suckers over here and dipping them in water to make them flexible, use them as uh, barrel stays and barrel hoops because uh, metal was pretty expensive. So this was an element which was very important and used also as export items uh, for some of the citrus crates down in Florida. They would actually use these hoop poles to hold them together. In addition, you know, what, what developed slowly was that certain cottage industries, uh, weaving, repairing boots, leather, working with metal, uh, became light industries. Many of the homes had what they call L's, which are these perpendicular um, extensions onto the house. And some of these actually were small workshops, were developed and, and built that, so that groups of people could get together and um, you know, build anything from uh, barrels to Cords wainers were actually shoemakers, um, leather workers, whatever. So you can see that over time, what developed as, as really crafts and uh, self-sufficient manufacturing on the farms and individual homes turned into workshops and then later factories. 
what, what was especially important was spinning and weaving and cloth making. Uh, it was, I think the, the real log jam in terms of trying to make woolen cloth was the amount of spinning that had to occur to create the yarn. Once the yarn was, was made, it was relatively easy um, to weave it and you could weave fairly quickly, but you needed a lot more people actually spinning the wool into yarn than the people that were actually weaving. So I'm gonna let Bill talk a little bit about some of the early transportation in the form of roads and turnpikes and the need for um, various inns and taverns along these different stage lines. Thank you, Doug. The um, roads of yesterday weren't anything to write home about. Yeah. And the condition of them was the responsibility of the citizens of the town to keep the roads in repair. So sometimes people got paid to take care of a section of road. Sometimes they uh, did it just on their own. But nevertheless, the roads, like I said, were not really that much. Uh, over time, they began to get a little bit better. And this perhaps is why the railroad, when it came along, was such an improvement. But it would take, old accounts suggest that people would load up their wagon to go into Boston and they would leave in the morning, like four or five o'clock, and spend the day in Boston Market selling their produce and then coming home after dark. So you could see it was a long, long day, and sometimes they would even stay over. The, uh, the business of trading was, before we had monetary, means was up to the farmers and the people that who are manufacturing things like the Fletcher brothers and Acton Center who uh, produced boots, shoes and stuff. And um, the home, the people at home could make up pats for the shoes, pats for the boots and trade them with the Fletcher brothers and to become part of their product. There are other people in town like uh, the, like Jonathan Billings who built clocks. Billings um, got his brass and stuff from Concord and he also made base files. Uh, the only one that seems to exist today is one out to Sturbridge Village. The South, South Acton people, uh, they were weaving cloth and bringing it up to the wool, up to uh, Erickson's grain mill today to have it f go through the fulling process. And in the fulling process, the wool is wet and a series of rollers flatten it out and if you look at a sweater, yes, there's a lot of gaps in between it, but when you get done with the fulling process, the fulling has uh, closed up all of the spaces in between. Early on, there was cloth production in Acton as well along Fort Pond Brook and down along the Shoba Brook. Um, and what they were doing was taking cloth and printing it. Uh, other businesses that happened, that just happened to dominate were uh, the tin shop in West Acton and also the um, making of wooden barrels built by Coopers. And also one more thing about the uh, the those bean pole things along. They were also bent to make mast hoops. In other words, they were bent around a number of times and you would 
use them on the mast of the ship to hold the sails. Hmm. So, um, as Bill said, there was you know quite a lot of inter industry in the different villages of Acton. We're going to get to that in a second. What really enabled, I think, um, industry to take off was the beginning of the railroads. Um, in the early 1930s, 1830s, there were basically three railroads coming out of Boston. There was um, the Boston Lowell going up to the Lowell factories, uh, Boston and Providence that would go down eventually to New York, and then Boston and Worcester out to the West. And Acton lobbied like most towns um, to get a railroad to get through its town because it was so important, not just so that the farmers could develop their markets, but so that um, various goods could be received for commerce, uh, shipped out again, and to develop beyond just the local market. So everyone you know, was, was pretty much all lobbying for railroads to come through. Um, Acton's merchants and leaders were very involved in this. Winthrop Faulkner and Daniel Weatherby, they knew exactly what it would do for their mills. Um, Bradley Stone in West Acton for real estate and um, Weatherby and, and Eldridge Robbins in, in East Acton. Um, just, just to give you a sense with this, uh, to orient you, uh, of the four lines that eventually made its way through Acton, um, right here we have the Framingham and Lowell, which came in from uh, West Acton up to North Acton where it split. Uh, one, uh, the Lowell side here on the right, and over here is the Nashua Acton in Boston, which went up to Nashua, another big mill town. Down here, you have the Fitchburg line going through South Acton and West Acton, and then down to Maynard and Marlboro and the Marlboro branch. So we'll go through these briefly because some of you may have attended the presentation we did on railroads in Acton, but clearly the Fitchburg was the most important for Acton, not just because it was the first, um, and there was an awful lot of, um, you know, inactivity after the Fitchburg Railroad was developed because of the Civil War. Things didn't pick up again until the 1870s. Um, so this, this was a major line eventually making its way out west, and it really created, as Bill said, uh, South Acton and West Acton, uh, which, which were not that, I mean, the South Acton had some mills, West Acton was not very developed at all. As you can see from this this map, um, the Fitchburg Railroad went right through here. Uh, it branched off um, down where Main Street is now, um, which is now the Assabet River Rail Trail, uh, to the Hudson, um, Maynard, and Marlboro. And you can see Fort Pond Brook. So a real concentration of both transportation and water for mill power. Um, initially, before steam, it was water power that really drove light industry in Acton and most of the New England towns. If you didn't have water power, you were pretty much dependent upon animal and uh, manpower. Um, so Bill, you want to talk a little bit about, you know, we can go back to South Acton, but um, West Acton also? Sure. West Acton developed somewhat differently than South Acton from the instead of manufacturing, which there was some of, it de developed more around the dairy business. And in the, the lower right picture, you can see on the left-hand side of this group of workers, a uh, fairly <coughs> large building where they stored the all of the uh, uh, vessels that they kept milk in. And of course, this stuff had to be kept <coughs> cool once it had been uh, secured from Elsie, the board and cow, cow, and keeping it um, fresh became a business of its own. A fellow by the name of James Wood Haywood started Boston Consolidated Milk Company in West Acton and he would buy up all of the farmers' milk 
going around every day to pick it all up. And again, it was like in these um, large, I don't know what you would call the things, but they're milk, uh, milk jugs, but they probably have like 40 quarts in them. And he would bring them all over to West Acton and then they would combine them and ship them in barrels to Boston to be processed further. Uh, there was another business that came out of West Acton as well, and that was with the Mead family. And that was the dairy, I mean, uh, eggs and that sort of thing. They would go around and pick up the eggs from local farmers and also pro fresh produce and bringing it into Boston. So these folks made money that way. It was a long, hard life. West Acton burned, I guess, a couple of times, but uh, everything that was there burned in 1913. Again, there was another fire in 1922. Uh, and so they had tough times there. And the railroad uh, provided a lot of work for local uh, residents. And I would think that uh, South Acton really had a lot, had, had the upper hand on uh, <clears throat> employing people. Yeah. But nevertheless, it happened. You have a section gang down below on the right hand side, and they would be in charge of just taking care of a section of, uh, of the railroad itself. Yeah. Uh, and then there were other people who took care of other portions of the railroad industry. Yeah. So in addition to um, the Fitchburg line, obviously those of you who are familiar with the Framingham and Lowell and the, and the Bruce Freeman rail trail here, you can see um, that this was a really important line coming up from, you know, West Concord uh, connecting with the Fitchburg um, and going up to Lowell. This really made the East Acton uh, village, village green area into a village. And unfortunately, when in the 1920s with the automobile, um, they closed passenger service, um, it, it resulted in East Acton kind of shrinking. They lost its post office, uh, East Acton lost its school, and um, it's not really considered a village now, but you can see down in the lower right, uh, what they're referring to is the East Acton Village Green. And that's the intersection of Concord Road here, uh, Great Road. Uh, this is taken where the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail is now. And the town is committed to restoring this and putting up some historic kiosks that Bill and I are working on. You can see the beginning of Bursaw Oil yeah. um, right here. My cursor is disappearing, but on the right of the Village Green. Uh, North Acton also was key because that's where the Nashua Acton Hi, Boston, that we'll talk a little bit about um, split hey. off from the Framingham and Lowell. It was a very strange situation of, of having tracks for two railroads on the same roadbed. And this was because the Nashua Acton and Boston uh, which went from Nashua through Dunstable, uh, Groton, Westford, into Acton, and then down to West Concord, uh, managed to petition uh, the state legislature to let it essentially use that roadbed with its own set of tracks. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen this Stone Arch Bridge in Westford. There's a, a rail trail, or it's actually more of a just a trail that goes over it. And um, I'm watching a history of acting. Yeah, um, if, if everyone could mute All themselves, right. that would be great. Um, so this was referred to as the red line because it was it never made any money. It was an example of during the big railroad boom of the 1870s. They really overbuilt. Um, a lot of it was speculation. A lot went bankrupt. A lot of them were consolidated. It was a pretty crazy 
bubble period of, of railroad building in New England and little towns like Acton though ended up getting four railroads. Um, so I'm gonna let Bill talk about um, the different industry that popped up in the five villages because it's, it's, an, it's a fascinating story of the evolution of Acton from light cottage industry up to um, uh, you know, real 19th century industry here. Yes, thanks, Doug. The uh, upper right-hand picture is Fletcher's Shoe Manufactory, and this is right on uh, the town common, believe it or not. It's just hard to believe it. If you look at the lower left-hand picture, here is the same building after it burned in 1862. Uh, the building on the lower left looks a lot like the town hall in that the fire that consumed the earlier factory on the upper right had a shingle that blew across the road and took the uh, second meeting house, which was our former townhouse. Acton Center did not have the interest in manufacturing that existed elsewhere. In South Acton, the picture that is the, at the top is the Erickson Grain Mill. It was uh, run by the, Harring by the Harringtons and this burned in 1975. On the, uh, the lower right hand side is the American, I mean, it's the South Acton Woolen Company. And this was an early industry in Acton from the standpoint of two brothers, uh, John and um, I'll think of the other ones, Reutzes. They came here and reprocessed wool and rewove it into a product that is known as shoddy. Now, we have some shoddy that survived. Uh, anybody that was in World War II had bl blankets made of shoddy and it was a good product, but the fact of the matter is it was cheap and it was reprocessed. Uh, something to keep in mind is, that, you know, well, let's just keep going here. The next building on the upper right is the Morocco factory. It was down uh, where the Assabet Rail Trail is and it consisted of a company that took skins and processed them, put a dye in and uh, made very good gloves, uh, like ballerina shoes, that sort of thing. A lower right-hand picture is the A. Merriam Company. Merriam came here from Meriden, Connecticut, where he had been manufacturing uh, piano stools, but they already had two businesses in town. And to get away from the competition, he settled in South Acton. He got burned out twice and eventually ended up down uh, at 115 River Street. Uh, Merriam closed around 1948, and uh, that was the end of, of them. There was vinegar works in South Acton, the uh, Parker Cider Mill, and Parker's in West Acton. They bought loads and loads of apples uh, and had vats where the, uh, they just put the juice to turn it into cider, and then they shipped it into Boston. The powder mill? Finally, we had the powder mills over on uh, Powder Mill Road, and that was on that 400 acre lot, of which still part of it is still there. It's owned by W.I. Grace Company, and they uh, manufactured black powder. Along in West Acton, we had, there was wooden wear and the, um, they made churns, buckets, any number of commodities that involve making, uh, fabricating wood and making <coughs> vessels. And let's see, we got uh, Knowlton Cigar Factory in West Acton. Knowlton bought local, locally grown tobacco, 
hired women to roll a tobacco and made cigars. And uh, that building was right on Mass Ave, right across the street from uh, Village Works. The foundation is still there today. Then there was um, in East Acton, we always, it was always the wooden uh, cutting and making of barrels and staves and stuff for, for buckets. And I don't know that we have really figured this one out totally, but uh, the Billings company was down in East Acton at the intersection of Weatherby Street and Great Road. They made barrels as well. And the so for, um, for North Acton, uh, not as much activity going on. If you've ever been through the trail, trail through time, um, there was Thomas Wheeler Jr., not to be confused with Thomas Wheeler of East Acton, um, who in the 1730s uh, created a grist mill and sawmill um, just below the Robbins Mill Pond, uh, quite a mill complex. Uh, there was also a road that went up to Pope Road to Concord, um, but the granite quarrying was, was, was pretty important because there was a special type of what they call slick and sides uh, granite that was very valued uh, for buildings uh, given its, its natural polished um, side. So I'm gonna move a little quickly here to catch up with, with some of the slides, but many of you know that there was pencil making going on in, in Concord and Acton that really began the whole pencil industry here. On the lower right, um, where the Bruce Freeman rail trail is now, connecting with the trail through time on the old Davis Road. Uh, there was the first, I think, uh, pencil factory in the area uh, by William Monroe. And this photo up on the top and the lower left is the Brook Street Ball Pencil Factory um, where, where pencils were made also. Up here you can see Brook Street, um, very cleared of, of, of trees and uh, the Conan house up here. Um, I'm gonna let Bill talk a little bit about some of the basic uh, schoolhouses. Um, this was a difficult thing to research. Um, if, if you want more information about schoolhouses, Lisa Sue did an excellent um, article in the Acton Historical Society website blog on the different um, Acton schoolhouses and, and school buildings. Thank you. Um, over time, Acton developed into six school districts and built a number of schools. Actually, some of the earliest still exist. Uh, the one that James Haywood taught in is still in West Acton behind 585 Mass Ave. And that is, I think, without a doubt, our earliest. Also from that same period, I, what I call the first period of schools, is another building down at 80-something uh, School Street. It's, uh, it's up on the hill. It's hard to see, but it's been converted into a house. It's a one-room schoolhouse with, that's been modified, and that's it for that era. There is a third schoolhouse that we don't know too much about down on Davis Road because we do, we have never been able to get into it and study the building, other than the last time I was in it, it still had blackboards in it. So that's, these are all pretty much before 1840. There were two brick schoolhouses and that the, uh, one of those was taken down two years ago, the one in the lower right on Harris Street. The wooden buildings, which were more prominent, more prevalent in 
this area. Uh, the one at 52 Harris Street has been owned by the Kendall family just about a century. The one on the upper left got converted into a house and the one on the upper right is the West School House that was taken down around the late 1950s, 1960 or so. It was one of tw twins. Uh, South Acton had one identical to it. The only difference was one had a cupola, the other one did not. Teachers. Uh, our schools had a few people like Clara Hapgood Nash, who taught in Acton a long period of time. Julia McCarthy, who grew up in South Acton, taught in South Acton from 1905 until 1955, only to die the following year after she retired. And um, the, the picture here is the Acton Center School. The upper left-hand picture gives you an idea and the lower picture of what these buildings were like inside. They were situated so that they got the full are as much beneficial sunlight as possible because they all go back before we had electricity. So I'm going to quickly zip through um, some of the churches in Acton. It's an interesting story because back before we had separation of church and state, and in fact, Massachusetts was the last of the 13 colonies to actually separate um, Civil, civil government and taxation uh, from the religious denomination that the Puritans had brought, which was Congregationalism. So up until 19, 1833, um, each colony or state chose which Protestant church, you know, keyword Protestant church, um, taxpayers would support. And if you were not a member of that church, uh, you could be fined. You couldn't hold public office. Um, if you were a dissenter like Roger Williams, you were kicked out and sent down to Rhode Island. Um, it was a, an interesting environment. Um, and this was the first meeting house on the left, which is obviously a, com a combination of town hall and church. And members of the, the church were running the town and vice versa. Um, eventually, the Congregational Church split um, into a more universalist, um, what they called the liberal wing, and they formed their own Unitarian uh, churches. Um, the Baptists came along. Of course, as immigrants came into Acton, Acton is, is, is a town of immigrants, uh, they brought their own churches with them uh, and their own preference for community and for our religious um, engagement. Uh, these are some of the additional churches that were established in Acton uh, from Lutheran, Meth Methodist, Episcopal, um, the Jewish congregation, and the Boston Metro West Bible Church uh, formed by some of the Chinese community, Chinese American community in Acton, uh, which was formed in Littleton. And of course, I'll, as a former firefighter himself, I'll let Bill talk a little bit about um, firefighting and departments in, in Acton. Sure. Uh, just an interesting sidelight on the railroads and always looking for a group that they could cater to we find way back that there were special trains on Sunday to cater to the town's Catholics. St. Bernard's down in Concord, which is built around 1860, along with the one in Maynard, about the same, uh, the early one about it, the same period of time, each had special trains set aside Sunday morning to make sure that the that the, uh, the Catholics were able to get to their masses on time. Now, getting along into the firefighting business, town of Acton has hesitate about 
jumping into in over their head on anything uh, found early on that they might want to have fire protection. 1842, there was an article that was shot down promptly to uh, build, a, organize a fire department. I have not quite figured out what the fire was that spurred this one, but however, after Acton Center burned, uh, it was mandated that the town should get better firefighting equipment. They did. They bought some ladders and some small operated hand pumps. Uh, again, 1892, when, Act, when Acton Center burned, uh, when the Fletcher Shoe Manufactory burned the second time and Reverend Fletcher collapsed at the fire and died, they decided to finally do something about it, and they built three fire stations, in each of the one in each section of town. Then they bought fire equipment, hand-operated pumps for each district. This was uh, increased a little bit by uh, 1900. They had built a new station in West, I mean, yeah, West Acton, and moved the old station out to North Acton, where it rested very interesting, most interestingly, down the end of uh, Harris Street, where the new station is being built down on the property of the Robbins family. East Acton had another station built down there, on the, again, on the property of the Robbins family. And this was a, a good way of doing business in Acton because they didn't own it. They didn't get, uh, they, they managed to keep uh, everything down at a very low cost to the uh, residents. South Acton Station, top left was built in 1927 by George Haywood. He was local. Resident born, I believe, in 1898 and uh, was a carpenter by trade. It is not what I consider one of his typical buildings, but nevertheless, uh, there it is. And it's for sale right now to the, by the town of Acton. His younger brother, I'm sorry, older brother, Earl, decided uh, he was a machinist and decided that... Uh, he could do his work for the town and built the town's first ladder truck along with a couple of more people that, that were close to him as neighbors and they built the uh, first ladder truck in 1927. Okay, so I'm gonna zip through this as we approach our hour here. Um, so the, these are some milestones in terms of some of the firsts in Acton. I'll let you read through them, but like most towns, um, in terms of infrastructure, telephone, electricity, street lights, and water, um, Acton moved along. Um, this really summarizes a lot of the growth that took place as Acton evolved from uh, light manufacturing and agriculture into housing. It was perfectly situated. You know, once again, the idea of, of transportation um, is key to Acton's growth, whether it was in the early years um, or in terms of the modern commute along Route 128 and Route 495 and Route 2, perfectly situated. Um, the development of Cold War uh, industry along Route 128 with the high-tech boom, Hanscom Field, um, absolutely critical to the, the growth of Acton as a residential bedroom town. This shows, I think, the, you know, fairly gradual growth of a small town in New England up to about 1950, um, when a lot of the the farms were converted into housing complex, especially along Route 2, 2A, I mean, um, you know, an astounding type of growth. 
you know, once again, we, we talk about Acton both as a colonial town as, as an immigrant town also. Um, each group of, of people that came in put their stamp on the town and, and helped with the diversity and helped grow this town um, to, to what it is today. The Asian American community is an exceptional community that is, has come in and, and grown starting uh, initially in the early 20th century. Down on the lower right, there's a newspaper uh, clipping that Lisa found in the archives talking about the Chinese laundry expecting to be open for business, 1903. In 1940, there was a very large chicken farm um, around 1000 Main Street um, up in North Acton. And it's something of a mystery in that in 1943, uh, everyone just left. They, people don't know really where they went. I think that at some point we'd love to do a, a special presentation on some of these mysteries of, of Acton. But, but clearly the opening up of China in 1970s um, really opened, you know, essentially the immigration into Canada and the United States, initially with students um, who stayed here, raised families, got jobs, um, and really built a, a very vibrant community. And today we have the Chinese language school here in Acton, the civic society, and um, you know, a very engaged population. And this is also similar to the experience of the South Asian Indian community um, who came, who started earlier, uh, more in the 1960s, um, and they've developed, you know, another professional group of folks, um, initially uh, starting in IT and engineering and software. Um, and now again, um, and these, right here we have Don Wong from the Acton American, his, uh, I'm sorry, the Acton Chinese American Civic Society in Sananda Sahe, who developed the essence of India that was at Nara Park for seven years, uh, that, that really opened up um, not just to Americans, but the Indian experience to folks uh, from Bangladesh and Pakistan and China, uh, a very inclusive, very um, extensive approach um, to educating everybody about Indian culture. So I'm gonna quickly go through, we've, we've reached our hour already, and Bill and I have a, an agreement that we won't keep you for more than an hour, uh, but these are some of the more significant buildings and sites in, in Acton. Jones Tavern, uh, Faulkner Homestead, both managed by Ironwork Farm, um, the Jonathan Hosmer House, here in its um, renovated state on the left, and back when it was uh, a victim of arson in the 70s on the right, uh, Historical Society bought it for a dollar and um, has, has restored it. And we hope to open again soon. Um, the Isaac Davis Monument in the center of town, uh, promoted after um, one of the celebrations of the Battle of the Old North Bridge, promoted by James Woodbury, um, who got the legislature to approve money um, to essentially build the monument. And then um, the remains of Isaac Davis, Abner Hosmer and, and James Hayward were interred underneath it. Um, the Memorial Library that was initially built to honor the veterans of the Civil War and has been extended, a, an incredible cultural resource in, in town, Town Hall. And um, the lottery houses that uh, four individuals from Acton uh, won the Harvard lottery. Harvard had a lottery, Harvard University had a lottery uh, to finance some of the buildings of their campus. And these four individuals won the lottery and built uh, their own homes. Um, and of course, Exchange Hall in, in South Acton. So that's it. <laughs> and people can unmute themselves uh, and Bill will take questions. See if you can stump Bill and just, just jump in and throw out your, your questions at this point. 
Um, I, Bill, you mentioned um, uh, the large powder mill that was um, done on Powder Mill. Were there, were there other uh, powder mills along that road as well? There are two divisions to the American powder mills. There is the black powder division, which is the path that you see remnants of along Powder Mill Road. And if you go out Knox Trail, you run into the Smokeless Powder Division, which was built around 1900. The Smokeless Powder Division was uh, is just a huge building, about 700 feet long, and it is built to be explosion-proof, which the other buildings were not. And, and were, were, were there not several explosions <clears throat> During, I think, World War One, I, I think it was, the, along the Powder Mill area? Uh, Between 1833 and the Second World War, there were a lot of explosions, typically taking out a building along with everybody who was in it. Hmm. I don't know how many people have been killed over there. Greg, did you have something? I thought I saw your your hand icon raised. <laughs> no, that was an applause icon. Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you. Does the Acton Historical Society have any plans to purchase additional buildings? I don't think so. Um, we had hoped to save the Harris Street brick schoolhouse at one point and put it on our campus. As, as you know, may know, it, there are three historic buildings in you know, the Hosmer House, uh, a 1920 uh, library, the Jenks Stone Building, and an old um, 19th century barn. But I, I don't think we quite have the funds to be saving any historic buildings, unfortunately. Any other thoughts or questions? I know it's an awful lot of material to absorb. We, we, we wanted to get it all out there, but uh, Robert? I think you're on mute, Robert. Let me see if I can... Uh, okay, is that better? Perfect. Okay, so. I'm wondering if the uh, the historic path across the Conant land is ever going to be reopened for the uh, route to Concord? The agreement with, over that piece of land is that it uh, is privately owned and that uh, it can be used on special occasions like typically April 19th to cross. Uh, that was a road to, that is the old road to Concord. It was closed about 1808 and basically is not uh, a throughway, even with the, with the rail trail there. But uh, nevertheless, it's only to be used on special occasions. Is the, on the other side on the, uh... Great Roadside, there's a, a dam on the Shoba Brook that I guess is not in very good shape, but we always used to walk across there on Patriots Day for years. <laughs> and I just was wondering whether it was ever going to be used again. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard to tell at this point in time. Okay. Was this the old Davis Road? you're talking about that connected the pencil mill or was this the one near the uh, Robbins mill dam? I don't know because the one up by uh, at the pencil factory has been in bad shape is I'm going to say for the last 50 years or so and they cemented it up with uh, back when it was owned by uh, Bellows Farm, but 
it didn't wor work out well and it basically helped to the deterioration of it all. Yeah. Hunter? Yeah, as a uh, recent transplant to Axon, this presentation was just exactly what I've been looking for for the last year. It's given me a tremendous perspective for the history and of the, of the area. I wanted to really thank you for it. I'd like to do a separate one. Well, thank You're you. welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> My wife just said she you couldn't hear her in the background, but she'd like to hear more about the buildings. I'd like a separate yeah. call for the buildings. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I apologize for the amount of material we, we tried to squeeze into this one hour, but I think we'll try to do some more presentations. And, and I think um, a special session on the buildings, the historic buildings of Acton would be great. So thank you. Oh, I think it would be wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Are these programs recorded and are available yes. for a replay? Yes, they are being recorded. And what we do is we put them up on YouTube. Um, the Acton Historical Society has its own YouTube channel. So, you know, generally a few days, a week or so after the presentation, you can just search on Acton Historical Society on YouTube and find them. Great. Thank you. Wait,